everybody. I am Marina Malaguti, and I'm your host at Embossed. Embossed is a podcast I've created to highlight women with amazing paths of success here in Chicago. Last year, I set out to interview the only 40 female CTOs in the city, and this year I've expanded to uh, female CEOs and women in politics and government in Chicago. I'm excited to share these interviews with you, and I hope you contact me at www.unbossed.io or email me at marina at unbossed.io. Hope to see you soon. Robin Uru Simmons is a strategist, civic entrepreneur, and older woman, older man of Evanston's Fifth Ward. Older woman Ru Simmons began her career 22 years ago when she launched her first business as a real estate broker. Troubled by the wealth disparities and concentrated power in older communities, she wanted to help young adults build their build wealth early through home ownership. Over the course of her entrepreneurial career, she has launched and operated multiple businesses, including a bookstore that offers free after school programming and a construction firm that employs dozens of minority skilled tradespeople and has developed dozens of affordable home funded and has developed a, a dozens of affordable homes funded by the neighborhood civilization program. Ruth Simmons was elected fifth award Alder Men's to the suit of Avenue President 17. Since taking office, she has prioritized improving the lives, experience, the lived experiences, and expanding opportunities for black, for black residents. Most notably, she led the passing of the nation's first reparation program, which will be funded by the first 10 million of adult use cannabis sales tax revenue from the city of Pakistan. Robin is the chairman of the Reparation Committee, a strong advocate for social equity applicants in the cannabis business. Known for her solutions only approach in service and business, Alder Woman is the Director of Innovation and Outreach at Sunshine Enterprises, which has supported over a thousand neighborhoods and entrepreneurs, 98% African American, 74% women, in launching and growing the business. She also serves as Chief Strategies at Mujima Solutions Group. LLC, in addition to managing residential and commercial property that she owns. In her free time, she enjoys her family, new experiences, and forest. Welcome, Robin. Hey, everybody. This is Marina, your podcast host with Unbossed. Today, um, I have the pleasure to talk to Robin Rue Simmons. The, a public policy strategist, entrepreneur, and currently elder woman of uh, uh, the city of Evanston. Welcome, Robin. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation and for highlighting unbossed women. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so I start you off with something that perhaps will take you back a little bit. Um, you know, I am looking to highlight your professional career, but I was wondering, like, as a little girl, did you ever thought you'd be where you are right now? And if not, how was it growing up? And um, where did you think you'll be? Hmm. So as a little girl, I would say my life has been steadily on a path and trajectory towards uh, public service in serving community through community service and appointed service and um, service through my business and my personal value. So I was certain that I love my community, Evanston, my village that I was raised in and that I wanted to give back in some way um, in my adult life. Uh, being the alderman is not that far off from um, what I would have aspired to do, uh, but what I've been able to be a part of in my term as alderman uh, was certainly not envisioned. And I'm very proud of um, the work that I've done along with my partners, my colleagues, our allies, organizations in town um, recently to advance racial justice in our community. Absolutely. And we'll get into that for sure. Did you have anybody who was perhaps a, a, a an inspiration um, that led you into this type of uh, giving back to uh, social work, giving back to your community? Absolutely. So I'm really fortunate to come from a family of strong women that are 
uh, servant leaders and come from a community that has many examples. Um, not only my grandmother and my aunt and mother, the community leaders like Alderman Dolores Holmes, the alderman before me, who also was the executive uh, director at a nonprofit that provided programming to um, neighborhood families that needed it. Um, we had, you know, uh, Mayor Morton and even Mayor Tisdall. Um, so I was very fortunate not to have to reach so far beyond uh, my village, folks that I could touch and learn from, my current mentors and elders. Um, but of course, I've always been inspired by the leadership and courage of Rosa Parks. And um, as my current work has grown, Queen Mother Moore and many others, um, but I'm fortunate to have examples in my family and in my neighborhood. Oh, that's really good. Um, and you started, uh, I think you went for school for, for mass communication and, and media study, which I think that now serves you real, really well since you're in the media a lot. Um, that's, that was uh, in Nevada, Las Vegas. When did you come back to Illinois? Um, so I was gone for 10 years, actually. I graduated yeah. school in 93 and I left for Las Vegas. Um, where I attended uh, school at University of Nevada, Las Vegas. I then lived in Michigan in the Detroit, metro Detroit area for five years. So I was gone away from home for 10 years. And I've been back now going on 20 years. It was important to me that I raised my children here in the village that served me so well. Mm -hmm. So I've been That's back, good. I raised my children here. I now have young adult children. Good. And um, I have been able to... Um, reach my goals of giving back to the community that invested so much in me. Yeah. Um, that's so, that's so cool. That's, that's, and the first thing that came up, that came to me was like, I have three daughters mm -hmm. and, um, so I have eight, four and now a baby, <laughs> like a month to three month old baby. But like, I was like, I, I came, it came, it came to my team. It was like, what? do they think about the work that you're doing uh, around reparations uh, for uh, Black communities in Evanston? Um, and what, what has been, perhaps, if you can give me a little bit of information about their experience around around this movement and, um, you know, for good and for bad as well. Like, I'm, I'm sure, yeah, I, I don't want to speak for you. I, I want to just know what it has been like for you as a family and, and them as well. Well, as I mentioned, my children are young adults, so yeah. um, they've been um, mostly away from home while I've been in the depths of leading this work, but they are my children, and they've been raised very consciously um, Black and proud of their heritage, and I could safely say they're satisfied uh, with my efforts um, and in their own ways working to... Um, you know, have justice for the Black community. Um, my daughter is focused on health equity. My son expresses his self through art. And it's in our family, it's been an experience of learning and it's been one of um, growth and challenges. And, um, and we're still on that road, you know? We have, we've begun important work and we have a lot more work ahead of us and so together um, I appreciate the intergenerational sort of feedback that I could get from them on their perspective. And, you know, they might keep me a little bit more up to date on what's happening on social streams. Um, yeah. It's been somewhat of a family project. Oh, that's awesome. What is something maybe that they could, they were able to show to you like that came on from social that, um, I don't know, maybe surprised you, I want to say about this? Um, I could think of one recent specific uh, conversation on um, fr their frustrations on the misinformation that mm -hmm. had been out on social media, which I had not been tracking. Mm -hmm. um, so being informed on that is helpful in uh, strategizing on how we put the facts out and how we educate um, the community and beyond our community and how we even improve the work. So, you know, some... Uh, grievances may be appropriate so we can improve the work, uh, but the misinformation, we can also be careful that we um, direct folks to the uh, the facts of the information. Mm, absolutely. Uh, thanks for that. Um, 
through the process of, um, and so, so that we can clear this up for our listener listeners, do you want to talk, give, I'm sure they will find this all over the news and they know who you are, but you want to do like a little bit of a highlight of um, the movement or the, the bills that you're putting forth in the city of Evanston. Um, so then we can dig into that. Sure. Um, so in 2019, I introduced uh, a reparations resolution for uh, repair and redress in the Black community of Evanston. Uh, it passed in November of 2019, Resolution 126R19. It restricts the first $10 million of cannabis sales tax revenue to begin to uh, reckon with or repair the damages done to anti-Black municipal policy in Evanston. Um, it was a robust community process that happened in 2019 that informed the priorities, which are repair in the way of um, housing, economic development, and educational initiatives. And so what we did recently in April, I'm sorry, actually March 22nd, we passed our first remedy action, which is a direct benefit of $25,000 um, for housing. Building wealth through housing is the most likely path uh, to build wealth for any family. It doesn't matter the background. And this will allow um, $25,000 of wealth generated through uh, home ownership in the Black community. It's the first of many programs to come, but we did take that important first tangible step on March 22nd, and we look forward to implementing the program and dispersing those benefits this summer. Amazing. Congratulations, first Thank of all. You. Yes, Thank absolutely. Um, so in your passage of the resolution, uh, R, uh, 50, what you mentioned it was 50R19, I think. Uh, it's actually 26R19. 26 okay. Um, I remember I, something that I read. I'm looking at my notes here. I remember something that I read where you said you sought a solutions-only process. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? Can you tell me what that means? What it means is enough with the let's study it, let's figure it out, let's commit to it without action, oh. let's priorities with no funding, enough of that. Solutions only is what can we do that is tangible and measurable, that we can implement what is a viable path to get it done in a reasonable amount of time. And that is all that I wanted to prioritize. I didn't want to be a part of any more discussions on why reparations and you know, debate about uh, what form. And I wanted us as a community to prioritize advancing the work, understanding that many forms of reparation are in order and take action. Uh, so that was how I introduced this work as a solutions only invitation. Um, definitely steered people in the direction of where they might go if they want to share their philosophical opinions and um, continue. Yeah. To um, debate, there's there's a place for that. It wasn't at this table. This table yes. was all about coming up with recommendations that we could put action behind. We could identify funding, and we could advance the programming. Yeah, that that is that is great. I I, I was reading about it, and I I kept, I'm wondering. I'm I'm glad that's 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 clear, and it's very 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 smart because we could talk endlessly about the, the, the philosophies and the theories behind reparations. Um, but um, the other thing that I was won wondering about is, was there a study done beforehand to understand the damage so that you could, I think I, I read something about it, right? Where you could understand the damage before, assess the damage before you could actually put out a goal for repar repar reparations. <laughs> Excuse me, what we had was data. And so it was the data that we had that led me to the introduction. Our data showed a $46,000 household income divide between Black and White Evanston, a 13-year life expectancy difference. We have, we have struggled with our achievement gap for a year, and we know how we got there. We got there because intentional anti-Black policies that were enforced and stripped away wealth and opportunity from the Black community. Mm -hmm. So there was no, um, there was no study about before we made the introduction on um, you know how did we get here? It was obvious how we got here. Uh, racism got us here, just like yeah. it it's responsible for the conditions in America. It's the same yeah. thing applies here in Evanston. Right. A specific policy 
that restricted the black community to living in one area of the city is what separated us physically and therefore um, financially or economically. So we started with data. We started with a commitment. We looked at uh, many resolutions we had in the past that committed to our values of inclusion and diversity and Black Lives Matter and so on. And we introduced reparations as an action plan to make good on the things that we say that we value. Absolutely. Thank you for that. That is that is amazing. I, as a data person, which is my job, I am uh, I'm extremely always happy to hear that data is used in order to make sure that um, you know things are measured and and identified and highlighted and and solutions are created out of out of that. So that's that that was great. Um, what is the goal ultimately? Uh, mm -hmm where what you're trying to achieve if you had um everything you and your community wanted what would that be well um the outcome that we're looking for is to bridge our racial divide for the black community to be made whole restored and for for us to enjoy the same livability as our white friends and neighbor that's the that's the hope um that goal in terms of uh, budget programming is still under development. Yeah. Uh, the initial program is a 10 year commitment with a $10 million budget. My belief it, it should be expanded into perpetuity. It's going to mm -hmm. take generations, many generations for us to um, bridge our racial divide. So right now we have a committee, a new committee actually that was just appointed a new yep. city council that's coming on that will build on the work that has been started in 2019. Beautiful. Um, would you say you use the same data, those, um, the wealth gap divide, um, the health gap, um, the educational gap, those same markers, are those the ones that you're looking at when you're setting these goals in terms of like closing up the divide and closing up the gap? So we need to be looking at every racial gap that we have. We need to look at every area of harm against the black community and looking at remedies for that. The city government alone will not be uh, responsible. Um, there are unfortunately many institutional accomplices that got us here. So what we have uh, passed in Evanston is that we will look to repair uh, in, in the space of housing and in the space of economic development, as well as educational initiatives. Nice. Now we have partners in town that should be matching or meeting us or partnering with us. We have um, health systems, healthcare systems in town that should be doing something reparative in nature. We just saw from the outcomes of COVID, the disparities in underlying health conditions, the impact, uh, the increased amount of fatalities in the black community, the economic devastation from the job loss from COVID, the healthcare system should be doing something. The educational system should be doing something. The business community absolutely should be participating. Yeah. So we know that there are many areas of harm. We have said yes to advancing those three areas and we are hoping to partner with other institutions in, in their form of repair that is due to the black community. Yeah, absolutely. Amazing. Um, thank you for this great first step, like you say, and, and there's many, many more steps that we can take. Um, I have a theory that I'm going to I'm going to throw throw at you and see what you think. But um, part of my my part of I think like what I want to do with my, my podcast is to continue to promote women to um, engage in in um, in creating and taking on careers in politics and, and social activism and things like that. And I went back and look at the stats for the Evanston City Council. And I realized that it's 60% female, 40% male. So you have a lot of uh, women on your city council. 30% um, people of color, for what I could tell, 70% white. Um, so what, what that tells me is that you have a potentially like a good female mix of like uh, people of color and white women on the city council for Evanston. Is that, am I correct about that? Yeah, you're absolutely correct. So we're a diverse city. Yeah. Um, we are predominantly uh, white and affluent. 
we are less than 17% of the community as a black uh, community at this point. And our, our 80th city council is the city council um, that I was elected to is the uh, most racially diverse maybe ever because we had a, um, a yeah, so maybe the most racially diverse um, ever. We tend to have strong, uh, prominent female leaders in town. So that's been consistent. Before our current mayor, we had um, a two women uh, mayor uh, before that. And so that's not uh, unusual in Evanston. That is sort of the, the brand of Evanston. We have strong women leadership um, and we have more gr growing diversity as well um, oh. in, in leadership. And we have the incoming most diverse city council ever. I mean, I haven't seen any sort of report on it yet, but based on what I know about Evanston, it is a very, a very um, diverse city council that is incoming. Beautiful. Um, and my question, my, my theory is, well, okay, so uh, for people that know this, the Chicago City Council, on the other hand, is 20% uh, female, 80% male. Now it is 60% people of color, 40% white. Um, and these are approximately numbers. So, uh, you know, take it with a grain of salt. But my theory is that um, the diversity within your city council was uh, a imperative variable in the passing of reparation. Do you have opinions on that? So I would say that um, it, you're right, and it goes even deeper than that. One of my core um, goals in coming into city council was to improve representation on our boards, commissions, and committees, as well as city council, of course. So it was important that I lead as a, a black woman, younger than the average elected in Evanston, a completely different background, um, non-traditional in many ways. Um, you know, having been a young mother, being an entrepreneur, um, that was important. But it was important that more voices like ours were included on leaderships of our boards, committees, and commission, which is where policy is begin. Uh, the outline happens in our boards, committees, and commissions, and so. Just like most every uh, policy started with an introduction to a committee, in the case of reparations, it went to our Equity Empowerment Commission. I was very intentional in sending it to that committee. I could have used my automatic privilege to put it on a council agenda and work with it along with my colleagues and, and look for a legislative path from there. But it was important that it went to that committee, a diverse committee that was chaired by a woman, uh, Alderman James Grover that included the leadership of Alderman Holmes, um, Pastor Monty Dillard, others on the committee. And it included members from the community who said yes to uh, equity, inclusion, and empowerment and were appointed by the mayor to do that work. Mm. So I do believe that it starting in that commission was important because that commission was able to work with the community through a process and then make a formal introduction to city council. And I believe that was part of the um, success and path towards reparations in Evanston. Yeah, and, and for us uh, civilians that don't know what that other path could have looked like, I think like, um, would you mind explaining that a little bit more? So if it didn't go through this committee and you would have taken it directly to city council, how could have that been different? And, and why is, why is, Almost like, I don't want to say why is it different, but kind of like, I'm like, why, why does that, why does it take one way and the one way works versus another way and the other way does not work? Well, the other way um, could have worked. Um, I thought it'd be more appropriate to go through the commission okay. because we have more opportunity for public engagement and especially mm -hmm. in relations, that's the priority that the injured community is leading the priorities. Got it. And so through the commission, there were opportunities to have about a dozen public meetings before it passed in 2019 um, okay. that allowed the community to come, have public comment. We had uh, working meetings where we asked simply, what forms of reparations would we like to see? How might we fund it and who should qualify? Um, and it was more appropriate that there was more mm -hmm. participation and the there from the community that led the introduction. 
Now, well, had it gone directly to city council, um, it, it, it would have needed to go back to those steps. It, we would mm -hmm. have needed to um, have uh, community-led meetings as well. And it was just more appropriate, as we see what the outcome was, to send it to commission first that had a body that was sure to um, honor and value racial equity just by the nature of the commission that they were on. So there was a lot of buy-in. There was their leadership, their own ideas. They were coming with their values to contribute to the work. And that path was most appropriate for our city. Mm. Amazing. I, that was very smart because um, you got that community engagement right up front and therefore your path was almost, almost, I'm going to say almost because it was probably not as easy as that, but it was almost cleared for the next step. And it had to be. And, it, and that was completely strategic. It wasn't happenstance. It was intentional so that when I had to work with my colleagues on city council, I was doing it not as a you know new alderman to the committee, but I'm saying, look, there were hundreds of residents from every one of your wards that were in support. Here are their stories. Here are their recommendations. Now here are letters of support from our senator, from institutional leaders. Here are letters of support from experts and organizations outside of our community that have been studying reparations for 30 years. So it's not just, it's certainly not political, it's certainly not, um, you know, short-sighted and only a personal mission of mine. This is packaged now with thousands of voices, including experts and stakeholders. And so now make a decision based on that. And nice. that was the goal. And it, it was proven to be effective in getting the support of the city council and passing. Beautiful. Thank you for that. And uh, very, very good, definitely very good strategy on your part to make sure that... Um, those those reparations get in action which you know you mentioned intentionality about this whole process and what came up to me was also like you know when you were starting to talk about reparation would you talk about a little bit what was that like for you like um we know we know there is pushback there's there's support but there's also pushback. Um, there's also, you know, the stigma of of um, having like having people of color carry the burden of repairing their wrongdoings, um, and and so I feel like there's it's politically charged topic. What was it like for you personally to put forth this motion? Um, and what was the process in your mind that perhaps finally convinced you to, to, to figure out a way to do it the correct way, the, the way you did it? Uh, well, I'll say that I didn't run my um, campaign for aldermen or even have a long-term vision to localize reparations in my city. It was a revelation. It was an aha moment mm. looking at data and looking at what we've done in the past, our trajectory. We were on a we were widening our racial divide. Our um, black home ownership rate was on a decline, uh, lower than it was before fair housing was passed. And, um, you know, the trajectory showed a continued decline in wealth in the black community. And this was before COVID. So mm -hmm. we still had not yet recovered from the Great Recession and the housing crisis. And we had, um, you know, to address our racial divide. Um, so for me, it was not uh, laborious. It was a recommendation that I made pretty immediately so that I didn't, you know, shy away from the work or, um, you know, convince myself it was, you know, not going to happen. I immediately made the recommendation through a, you know, a public process to hold myself accountable. Um, mm -hmm. I can't hold someone else accountable and I'm not holding myself accountable. So I made that recommendation and and began the work. There is no best practice. There is no other city that's done it. Even our federal government has not passed it. So mm -hmm. I was clear that there was going to be a hard uh, workload ahead to um, get consensus and to innovate the legislation and actually pass it in a way that was tangible. And I was up for the challenge. It was easy because I have incredible 
colleagues and we have an amazing staff. I worked very closely uh, with my colleague, Alderman Ann Rainey of the 8th Ward, Alderman Braithwaite joined the committee. We worked very well together. Then we had the support of NCOBRA, the National Coalition of Reparations for Blacks in America, NARC, the National African American Reparation Commission, and more recently, partners like African American Redress Network and uh, Howard and Columbia Law School. So it was uh, it was it was a lot of work, and I I didn't expect it to be so much work. I really thought I would make the introduction, find a best practice and a model in another city that had done it already, and we would retrofit it for Evanston and move forward. But that <laughs> happened. <laughs> Um, so there was more work than I was anticipating. I really, yeah. I would get it so far and then, you know, some, you know, university inst academic institution would come and, you know, figure it all out for us and just <laughs> give us some turnkey legislation and we <laughs> pass it. Like I, I really, I really thought that was going to happen. Um, it didn't oh. happen. But now I'm excited that the work has been done because we can now work with those universities and institutions and let them know what we've done. What was the model? The viable path that I saw for us was to lead with community engagement and our case for local reparations, which was done by Shorefront Legacy under the leadership of Dino Robinson and his partners at Evanston History Center, and then have a strong legislative leader that did not let it die in committee or shy away or shy away or kicked up the road to the next council that saw it through. And then a funding, a funding um, earmarked uh, a mechanism to actually deliver reparative justice to the black community. And so that's what we did here. And we've been able to kind of pass along what we've done as to other cities. Amazing, thank you. A couple more questions and then we can, I think we, I wanna talk a, a little bit more about you and, and who you are. Um, the first one uh, is something that I got from a part of the audience that I was discussing, I, I would talk to you at some point, hopefully, uh, uh, was, uh, what was what was the position, sorry, what was the position that you expected versus what you actually got? Was there anything surprising about it? And how did you handle it? Hmm. Um, I expected there to be a bit more challenge early on in mm -hmm. terms of um, how do we do it? It's never been done before and so on. There's very, very little of that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we've been doing the work for two years now. So the only position that was unexpected was very recently. So again, we've been doing this work since really February of 2019. And then to get to March of 2021, as if it was a brand new policy that had not been completely fully disclosed and transparent with substantial participatory programming and international attention like, wait, no, there's not been enough process or, you know, this isn't reparations. Like, wait a second, we just passed it in 19 where it was reparations, where we identified that it was housing, economic development, educational initiatives. We worked in committee for two years. And so I have to say that was really surprising, but it was also very political and that is expected and predictable. Um, but it was disappointing that it was um, misleading to the community that's already hurting, that already suffers from so much intentional misinformation, that is already, you know, concerned about our place here in the city. So it was expected, but it was disappointing that it was so um, organized and strategic in a misinformation campaign. Mm -hmm. um, I can say that it did bring up very important points that had already been discussed in the committee work for the last two years. Um, uh, and one point is that the financial institutions, their role in anti-Blackness and stripping away wealth mm -hmm. and how our program could support the financial institutions. Now that's just false, but we had thought about their role. And as a result of that, we have been advocating and, and pushing them to develop a reparation program of their own that includes reparative uh, mortgage products and other financial products. And in the meantime, what we're doing is we're providing resource guides to the reparation recipients 
on uh, black banks and other FDIC insured lenders that have a history of fair lending and other resources and educational tools to um, supplement um, and build on the benefits that we are going to be delivering. Amazing. Uh, yeah, that's very smart because um, I was just talking about this with, an, with another elder woman. Um, but, um, you know, the, system, the policies, the, 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 it's not only public policy that is in place that causes these disparities and these incongruent or these differences in, in communities is now has become part of the system. And so it's almost like as individual industries and individual companies have to rid themselves of those policies as well, because they have been embedded so much that is just a matter of like checking oneself and making sure that we are doing everything we can to make sure that we're not discriminatory against um, people in our community. Um, so I partner, like you said earlier, like partnering with companies in, in Evanston is it's great work. Mm -hmm. Thank um, you. Yeah, I have I have one more. Uh, how do you think we can make reparation happen in Chicago? Well, I'm glad you asked because Woo! the city of okay. Chicago, under the leadership of Alderman Rod Sawyer, Sawyer passed a reparation committee. They were going for a commission, if I understand this right, but they did pass a committee in July of last summer. Um, and now that committee was in human services is now being chaired by Alderman Stephanie Coleman mm -hmm. and Alderman Vasquez, Vasquez, Vasquez. Okay. Um, and, and so I don't know where they're at in their process. And so I would love for them to um, begin to the work. I know that the uh, chairs are committed to it and I would love to see um, the community um, support in COBRA in supporting the community who's been very um, key. So Cam Howard. Um, so I would love to see the Chicago community contact their older people and say, hey, we're in support of reparations. Where is it at in the legislative process so that we can participate, that we can begin to take action, we can identify opportunities to fund it. Like you have to start the work if you just stay paralyzed in you know, who's leading it and, and what's people's opinions and so on. The facts are Chicago has anti-Black practices that are harming the community historically and currently. Um, there are practices that are stripping wealth, that are inhumane, that are over-policing. Pick any one of them. I, I mean, maybe you don't want to start with housing like we did in Evanston. I believe the city of Chicago's um, first focus is actually health equity. Very mm -hmm. appropriate. Look at the conditions of COVID and the initial data that came out where it was staggering the uh, disparity in the black um, infections to COVID and deaths to COVID in the beginning. I don't remember those numbers, but start with health equity, move on to over policing, you know, deal with the wealth gap, but take an action. And I would love to see that happen. I believe that um, Alderman Coleman is capable of getting it done and all she needs right now is your support you can use your platform to you know to rally uh grassroots support and have them support her as she leads because it's uncomfortable and often it's lonely um you know she may be unpopular so instead of um you know maybe critiquing the way that she's doing or having grievances about the process and timeline reach out to her and say how can we help help move you this along? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I will do that. And for thank you. And for everybody listening, um, let's contact our aldermen and figure out if uh, a way in which we can send them an email, a letter, something that says we are in support of this and reparations in Chicago, and take uh, take as a model what you guys have done. Potentially, you know, it would be great to follow your lead. So thank you for the great work. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. And I've been able to speak to the committee. Um, maybe it's been in the last several months and now it's just time for next steps. But really, everything's a priority right now. You know, so it's you know, COVID responses and, you know, budget deficits and violence in the community, uh, which is really a, a symptom of, you know, poverty. You know, so start with reparations. And, and that's that's always going to be my position. Start with repair. And the rest that we're seeing is a symptom of 
um, the poverty that is intentional um, based on anti-blackness and intentional racism. So start with repair. Beautiful. Thank you for thank you for having also like the, the, the like to bring peace into this reparation process because it feels like this at least this conversation to me has felt very much about like you said creating peace and creating reparations for those communities so that they can be empowered to build their wealth. Right. Um, this is not a charity case, you know, where we're just building people to be their best, um, and this is what it feels to me. So. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for saying that. And that I agree with you completely. One thing that I saw is we do so much charity work where it keeps uh, the community dependent on the charity. Yes. Uh, so, you know, a voucher that keeps you dependent on a low income to qualify for that voucher or, you know, a food basket that, you know, give us a living wage job, you know, give us yeah. access to home ownership that is fair home ownership that allows us to enjoy the equity that grows over time and not forfeit the equity through some type of a program. Like give us access to wealth and opportunity, access to procurement um, at, a, at a city level, access to, um, you know, to capital so that we can grow our businesses. Like give us power so that we can um, create the lived experience that we deserve in the community. Amazing. Thank you so much. I have our my um, my outro question, which is like a few questions, just like uh, a few fun questions that I ask at the end of the podcast. Because believe it or not, we are here running at the end. Uh, and so, um, is there a book or a resource that you have gifted the most that you would like people to read or um, listen to? Um, so if if it relates specifically to uh, to reparation, local reparations. Okay, sure. Say, well, or any, anything you want. Yes. Anything that comes to mind that you feel like either you've read recently and has inspired you or or you something that you continually gift because you really like the message overall. So one thing and this is so there's so many uh, resources that have been important to my development and learning of reparations. And I would love to share that list with you. It's very robust. Uh, list. But but a book that I'm recently reading is actually um, Valerie Jarrett's uh, book and um, just learning about her leadership and um, how she uh, is an unbossed woman and yeah. has invented herself in ways to. Um, meet her personal goals of justice and equity um, has really been inspiring. And I didn't know it was actually gifted to me. Mm -hmm. And I have um, learned a lot and been empowered in ways that I may have had some slight insecurities about what's next for me and, you know, how to reinvent uh, myself while also staying very true to my values and my professional and life goals. Um, so I would say for your audience in particular, a uh, unbossed group of women, you might want to consider um, reading Valerie Jarrett's latest book. Okay. What do you remember the name of it? Just so that I can. I'll grab it for you. One second. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Uh oh, sorry. <laughs> Run the words. I'm like Googling at the same time. Area. So it's simply, back. I have it now, I have to set it up. Don't worry about it. My, my Zoom area back up. So yeah. it's simply finding my voice. Oh, finding my voice. Okay, great. Yeah, so I wanted to be able to show you that. Perfect, because I'm going to put the links in the podcast so people can just grab it up real quick and i get no money from any of this so just so you know the links that i put in you can buy this book whatever you want i don't I have no personal profit in anything finding my voice by um valerie jarrett thank yeah. you what is one book you would write if you haven't written one hmm i would write the book on uh, the road to local reparations. Wow. What would you call it? Do you have, you think, can you think of a, a title? 
Right now, I can't think of one better than the road to local reparations, but oh, that's, a good one. that's perfect. Yeah, but I'll I'll think of it. And that was inspired by Chicago Magazine did a story on our work here, and I believe it was called the road to reparations. If I'm not if I'm not mistaken, it was something like that. But I think it's such an appropriate title. You know, it's yes. not just the case for reparations, but how did you get there? And it really starts um, long before the legislative process. It starts with you know, any one of our Black families, uh, you know, childhood or experience here in history in Evanston and what that felt like um, being in Evanston as a Black person and um, the barriers that we overcame, the incredible resilience that we have as Black people to Mm -hmm. um, live amongst our white friends and neighbors and enjoy um, the quality of life that we are, you know, that that we deserve. Um, So, yeah, that would Mm -hmm. be the Beautiful. And um, what is the last thing you, last last few words, what is one thing, if, if the audience had to take away one thing, what is that one thing that you want them to take away? Trust yourself and take action. Nice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And if you want me to expand. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> You definitely, um, you know, we second guess ourselves so much and we don't want to look silly or unpopular, um, but we all have a very clear voice and vision within us. And I think if you quiet the noise and you trust yourself and your own assignment or path or a vision um, and then take that action, don't um, don't be afraid. Take the action It's for you. The rest, the resources, the relationships will come along with each step that you take along the way. Um, so take action. Thank, well, thank you for trusting yourself and taking action into this arduous process that has become uh, the start of a very fruitful endeavor uh, for your community. And thank you for coming on p- to my podcast. All right. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. I enjoyed Have it. A, absolutely. Have a good day. I hope you come back soon. Yes. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye.